Welcome back, students. This is another lecture in American National Government. Finally, we start looking at the course content, right? We are going to look at the history of Europe and raising the question, who governed in Europe, right? Why examine this uh, content? Why look at the history of Europe? Because America was formed by the immigrants from Europe. The British, French, Spanish, and other Western Europeans settled here. Why did they come to the colonies? What values and institutions did they have in Europe? Did they bring those to the US? If not, why not? So what values, what system of government did they come with, right? And why did they come here? Wasn't Europe like the best place to be at the time? Uh, before we get into this, let's go back to teaching methodologies for a second. I firmly believe that in the statement, basically, that uh, when you have no pain, there's no gain, in, meaning that if you struggle, if you do the work, if you do the readings, if you watch the videos, if you do your assignments, then there's a certain level of struggle. But that struggle is essential for learning. Not only are you reading and like watching, there's all that all sort of trying to remember, but also process information and also question your own thinking, right? Like, what did you know before? Oh my God, there's new information that totally does not agree with what I knew before. So all of that has to be, um, you know, done, right? And so there's a lot of effort. So I firmly believe that whoever works gets the knowledge, right, at the end. Hence, lectures will prompt questioning. They won't dish out all the information in readings and lectures. They are meant to make you think and do the work. Only those who work get the benefits. Here we have a video we should watch. So let's watch a little bit of it. You're in charge of watching all of it. Are you struggling in your calculus class? Do you have a hard time understanding your instructor? Do you wish there was... All right. I'm switching the sound off so I can talk. So here's a video, the history of Europe every year since 400 BC. Why should we watch this? It's an idea, it's a, it's a way for you to become aware of the different empires that existed, but also of the different kinds of political systems that existed, right? So we had all these empires, then we had these kingdoms, we also had city-states, finally we emerge with republics, so that's what you're going to observe. You're also going to see that most of these empires form in the Mediterranean. I wonder why that is the case. It has something to do with travel, maybe trade, right? So in Mediterranean region was very, very important for trade with Asia. So you have all these empires set up and millions of people are settling in these areas. Notice the population of Rome. Rome is going to become super big very soon. The other empires are not so important in Europe and won't be until 490 BC, or, or rather AD, rather. So pay attention to this video. Look at the evolution 
of the you know empire so roman empire will eventually start breaking into pieces and you'll watch that you'll see competition from various empires also happening and pay attention to that You'll also see the development of England around 1038 AD and pay attention to that. Uh, what else is happening? You see a lot of empires and the formation of republics where you have elections, where you have, uh, you know, the popular vote to change government doesn't happen until the 19th, late uh, 1800s and 1900s, where the title empire vanishes. And empire also has to do with colonialism. So you have these European states in the 1800s and 1900s, you're going to see that they have empires, they have colonies in Africa and Asia, which we won't see here, but that's what happens. And so they become empires. So I'll stop here. I want you to take a good look at the video. What else is going on? There's the population of the empires of Europe as well. So watch this video. This video is going to actually tell you, it can show you how these republics emerge. So this is a very, very interesting video to watch. It also, of course, talks about the populations of the various empires that existed and you know gives you an idea of which ones had more people in them the largest ones, right? So again, the sound is off. You can see though that the Ottoman Empire, the Kingdom of France, Habsburg, Spain, Russian Empire, these will be the main population groups and their names will change. And now they're empires. At some point, they will become kingdoms only. And sometimes again, they will uh, develop into empires as in the 1800s and 1900s. And then again, they will become Republican, Republican states as Republic, meaning that, you know, you have some kind of representational government. So it, they will no longer be ruled by kings, though they might have a ceremonial king. So we'll look more about these political systems. Um, let's go back to our slide. All right, so let's go to the next item. So in assignments, always take notes on what videos you watch and what readings you do, as you will probably get a question about those readings and videos in the discussion forums, right? So take notes and uh, think about what you saw and then write down some main things and then be ready to share your observations and critical analysis with the class. So the questions I had after watching the videos is who governed Europe? So we saw during the ancient times, we saw the number of empires and different groups. We saw the rise of Rome. During the Middle Ages, what did we see? So pay attention to the, you know, 10, 900 AD all the way to say the 1600s. And after that, you might have some more modern things emerging, maybe 1700s. 1800s, 1900s are definitely more modern. There's a lot of scientific development happening in that time, right? What questions did you have? after watching the videos. Let's see what else is happening. So of, of course, a major theme in these videos is constant change, right? Because you're watching time-lapse. Time-lapse videos will show you the change. 
Sometimes, of course, there's very little change depending on what you're watching. But here we saw a lot of change, right? In the type of state, were they empires, were they republics, were they city-states, right? We saw all of that. Questions about power. So my main questions were who governed these territories? What were the empires like? How much power did the rulers have over the people? What power did people have? Did they have rights and liberties? So to understand that, we need to watch different kinds of videos. Let's watch some. So the next few videos elaborate about the political situation in England, France, and Germany. Uh, you guys are going to watch uh, a little bit about the Magna Carta, which has to, which is a political document related to the English political system in the Middle Ages. Let's watch a little bit about that. I'll put the sound back on and you can watch that. This may look like a plain, unassuming piece of parchment, but it's actually one of the most famous documents in the world. Magna Carta, meaning the Great Charter, has inspired people across the centuries, from Thomas Jefferson to Mahatma Gandhi. But why was the Charter originally created, and what does it actually say? Let us take you back to medieval England. It's the year 1215, and the ruler is King John. Many people believe that King John was one of the worst kings in history. He imprisoned his former wife, he starved his opponents to death, he allegedly murdered his own nephew and pulled the beards of the Irish chiefs. King John had imposed heavy taxes on his barons in order to pay for his expensive foreign war. If they refused to pay, he punished them severely or seize their property. The barons demanded that King John obey the law. When he refused, they captured London and John was forced to negotiate. The two sides met at Runnymede in June 1215. The result of the negotiations was written down by the King's clerks into the document we know as Magna Carta. Although most of the Charter's clauses dealt with medieval rights and customs, Magna Carta has become a powerful symbol of liberty around the world. The most famous clause, which is still part of the law today, for the first time gave all free men the right to justice and a fair trial. No man shall be arrested or imprisoned except by the judgment of their equals and by the law of the land. To no one will we sell. However, this no clause was not as... Okay. So here we are back at the Magna Carta. So you saw that it's a political document. What's a political document? It's about power sharing, right? So let's see some of the... So it's 1215 AD, England is not a stable kingdom at this time, as we saw before. There's contest for power between kings and lords. Some rights are given to free men. Here, the free men is a big question. Is it the lords? Is it everybody? Lords have land, soldier, and also workers. They have power, right? If you have soldiers, basically if you have money at that time, you can get people to fight for you. They also have economic wealth. They have workers working in the fields, growing food. So lords are kind of comparable to the power of kings. The power of kings is not yet solidified. And this is for England specifically, you saw their tiny states, right? And so the lords can push back on the king and that's what happened, right? And so they were able to negotiate better rights. 
for free men. And here free is a big question mark. Who's free? But do watch the video and do read the Britannica.com link. So for the Magna Carta, the economic system is feudalism. What does that mean? And what is an economic system? And of course, we are looking at power, who gained power, who lost power, who are the free men, who are not the free men. These are the big questions. What's an economic system? An economic system is basically, uh, you know, organization of production, right? Uh, so you might ask, how is the economy set up? Who owns the means of production? Who owns the land? Who owns the factories, right? Who only has their labor to sell? So some people are, you know, landowners. They have factories. They're the rich guys, right? Who is so poor that they only have their labor to sell? Those are the workers, right? How much do the workers get in return for their labor? They get wages, right? But how much are they getting? How much do owners of land, capital, and technology get? Of course, we're getting to the question of how fair is the system? Who does it benefit more, workers, landowners, or capitalists? Are the people of the land happy? Ultimately, if they're not happy, what's going to happen? They're going to start fighting again, right? So we want to keep them happy at all times. So look at 1000 AD to 1800 AD. You tend to have societies which are agricultural. They're engaged in trading. They're engaged in manufacturing because they're making stuff, they sell to each other, right? But states support these kinds of groups at times. So whenever you have states supporting directly any block, any of these groups, um, that's a significant development. In the 1800s, or rather, not 1800s, but somewhere in the say 1400s onwards, you see a lot of state support for traders. So these are yeah. maritime traders. And this is the system of mercantilism. Additionally, since 1800s, you have industrialization, mechanization of agriculture, banking, a lot of technological development. You have new kinds of transportation like railroads. You have ships, uh, steam power, and all kinds of developments, right? What else is happening? Also look at class. What is class? It means your relationship to the means of production, meaning do you own any factories? Do you own the land on which you work? Do you have any freedom? How much, uh, how many hours do you put in? You know, what, how does your boss treat you? So these things are determined by class, basically. These are rather, these relationships uh, tell you something about the class. Additionally, after 1800s, you have industrial capitalism. So the rise of industry and mechanization and agriculture, you have different kind of system and set up relationship between industry and industrialist and worker exchanges. You also have the development of banks and industry. You have uh, industrialization, uh, but also re close relationship with banks versus workers, right? So this is a different kind of class setup.
So look at all these issues, the degree of economic inequality in each system, the degree of exploitation of labor, degree of power inequality. Who does the state take sides with? These are questions, right? So we'll come back to these issues. Let's stop here for today.